This week he had two articles to read before watching this video. First one is by Yannick Marchand. This is possibly one of the best articles on early modern accounting that's ever been published because it deals with a division of method that is rarely discussed in any detail and that is charge and discharge versus double entry bookkeeping. It starts off by saying right in 18th century French companies you find them using one or the other usually. Double entry was the merchant's model. It was what trading companies would use. And it was used in the textile industry where the capital came from trade. So basically it was still in the trading sector. Charge and discharge was the kind of model of mining and metallurgical enterprises where the capital mainly came from the nobility or the financiers. And he defines the financiers as basically the uh, taxation or the finance department of government. The detail does not stop there. And he actually, he doesn't contradict himself, but he presents information which in his tables, which provides a much clearer view. The French companies he investigated by looking at their articles of association or their surviving account books or, or reports, whatever. He said that in large trading companies, they were using double entry. Mining companies were using charge and discharge. Nearly all the metallurgical companies, the companies that used what came out of the mines, in terms of metal, metal came out of the mines, was double entry. And the textile companies used double entry. And going back to metallurgical companies, he said the companies use double entry, but in general, enterprises, metallurgical enterprises, use charge and discharge. And that tells us that the companies had a different motivation, and companies are companies because their ownership is divided and can be traded. He also says that charge and discharge, which is based in or is the former accounting used typically for stewardship is founded on the separation between capital and management, the ownership and the management. And it's centered on the notion of responsibility, accountability and control. So charge and discharge, which effectively looks at the cash balance and assesses whether it's correct or not. And if it's not correct, then the Typically, the cashier or the bookkeeper would have to make up a difference. Whoever is responsible to make up a difference. That one looks at the management. Have they controlled what's going on in the business effectively in terms of that resource? And that's what it was used for. And it was used for much, much longer in double entry and right across several parts of Europe, including England around the time of the Norman Conquest, for example. Now, this is, these are things that the double entry also can provide. There's the identification of things for responsibility, accountability and control. And in the latest conceptual framework of the IASB, stewardship is one of the things that they focus on. Now, double entry is used for that. And you'll see an example of double entry being used for that in the 16th century in one of the later readings. But... So basically, this is, this is what charge and discharge gave you. Double entry at that point in time wasn't seen as being capable of giving you that. So that was effectively what he was saying in terms of the two methods. And that over time, by the 19th century, all enterprises had begun to move to double entry because of the complexity of what they were dealing with, the industrial companies. They needed greater control the greater information that is provided in a double entry system as opposed to a charge and discharge system. And that's why they switched. And there was also the pressure by the, the owners of the business when they were represented by people that had invested in shares in the company. They wanted to know rather more, and he gives a good example of it, rather more than just what a trial balance contains. They wanted the detail you would typically see in a balance sheet. 
and you learned about what sort of things you'll see in a balance sheet when you read the second article for today. So to sum up, what he identified was complex business needs of the Industrial Revolution he'd thought was a catalyst for the adoption of double entry beyond the merchant world and the needs of owners for the emergence of financial reporting. So those are the two main messages coming through there, apart from who used double entry, who used charge and discharge, and why they used one, not the other. Now that should resonate with what you read previously in this article, where Stoner identified the Industrial Revolution as a catalyst for the emergence of financial reporting. The same point, but in a different, with different emphasis, as was made by Le Marchand. And if you look back through all the, the things you've been reading so far, they all fit together like pieces from a jigsaw. And they give you a much bigger picture when you combine them all. So if you missed any out, unfortunately you won't get that strong message. You'll only get parts of it. Second article was this one. And it revisited history because Historians in the 1960s and 70s, two in particular, had drawn conclusions about the bookkeeping and the accounting in two Portuguese international trading companies. And they've been very critical of those two practices. Whereas accounting historians who had looked at them, not in the depth undertaken in the study, but looked at them, had felt they were fine. They were in double entry and their reporting was fine. However, Historians' writings have been used fairly extensively in, in the literature, so it seemed appropriate to revisit the history and have a look at what really happened, because none of the historic accounting histories that had been written had gone into any great detail. So we couldn't tell from what had been written by accounting historians whether or not the historians were wrong. And there's a lot of issues covered in this paper. The key ones to note is the focus on a Whig interpretation, which views history as inevitable progress and improvement, sees the present and looks for a sign of progress towards it in the past. I've talked about this before. It's that approach, which you can see fully described in the paper, that has caused the accounting history literature of medieval Europe in particular, but also early modern Europe, that is up to 1800, it doesn't reflect what the evidence shows. Because the focus has been on trying to recognise things in the evidence that we recognise today. Now this big interpretation or approach to history is often adopted in response to a lack of knowledge and understanding of context. The context that surrounds the evidence, the action or the practice located in the past. And we covered that before in the course too. And this is emphasised at the beginning of this paper. Context is essential to an understanding of history. But accounting historians have ignored it because they've relied instead on this Whig approach. Whereby they see, they know what happens today and they just look for it in the past. The next thing that's covered in the paper, um, quite prominently at the beginning, is interdisciplinarity, which according to the paper can take many forms, including using theory from other disciplines, which is what accounting historians recently in the last um, 30 years have been doing, particularly from philosophy and sociology, using works of members of other disciplines and collaborating with members of other disciplines. Now, the problem in that is highlighted in this paper about that is that only the first of those has really been used by accounting historians, which means that they haven't embraced it interdisciplinarity in the way that, for example, Arnold says it should be embraced. But going back to context, and understanding the context within which accounting techniques evolved and were used allows examinations or explanations to be developed and better founded generalizations to be made. So knowing the context really does help. Whereas using the theories, which is the approach that's been adopted recently from philosophy and sociology, only gives you an explanation within a context that is viewed from the present. And that is effectively means that 
the interpretation is going to be, at the very least, biased by present-mindedness, which is being unable to eliminate our knowledge of the present from our study of the past. And if you don't know the context of the past, it's almost inevitable you're going to do that. By moving slowly to, towards working with those from other disciplines, which accounting history has done, accounting historians are foregoing an opportunity. They're not inviting others into their studies, and instead they're opening the door to big history and interpreting past events from the perspective of modern values, the point I made. And a Whig approach to history can only by accident reach correct conclusions concerning historical evidence, action or practice. So all those things were put into the into the first part of the paper, setting the scene for what came next, the case study. And effectively that what I was doing was saying, here is what we need to remember or be aware of. We need to understand context, interdisciplinarity approaches and Embracing all aspects of interdisciplinarity, not just the theories. You cannot ignore the historical context of what you're looking at if you're examining something from a historical perspective. If you place the history that you're looking at within its organisation, social and historical context, the study of it is liberated from the constraints of the present. So you get rid of present mindedness, you get rid of Whig approaches. And that's a point made more than once in the article. And the article is about Portuguese trading companies, two international trading companies that went from Europe to Brazil. In fact, they went from Africa to Brazil. And it uses manuals, three manuals, which were the textbooks and in those days they dictated the textbooks to the students, so these were copies of either printed editions or the original manuscript from a student of what was taught. And the students attended the first government-sponsored school of business in Europe, which was established in Lisbon in 1759. And that tells you that the Portuguese government were ahead of the game. They really wanted to get their employees in government enterprises fully equipped with the most latest techniques and methods including double entry bookkeeping which was taught in that school and from that school some of the graduates went into the companies that the paper is about the study the paper looks at or goes on to look at the financial reporting the bookkeeping and then the financial reporting of the two companies and it presents to you the annual report. Several pages, and it shows you most of the pages. It shows you a resume, a summary of it. Compares that to what's in, the, in one of the textbooks. And describes how it compares to, for example, the annual report of the English East India Company. And it finds that it is very sophisticated for its time. It used venture accounting which was the same form of accounting used in medieval Europe, in Florence and Venice, as you learnt from the Frederick Lane article, was the way that inventory was recorded. Now, if you take what you saw in that article, the examples that you saw of the reports, this is the medieval equivalent of those reports. This is a list of balances on accounts at the end of a period. On the right, you've got effectively what it says on the left. The symbol in the middle is the trademark of the, of the Dottini partnership, which is what this is, the Francesco Di Marco. His family name is Dottini of Prato and Co. And this is his branch in Barcelona. And every year his branches, and he had several across Europe, had to send to him this report. Then you get the first page with debtor or debit balances. These could be for debtors or they could be for assets. Second and third page were debit balances. There's no sense in this of left and right. It's all the same balance. Debtor balances, debit balances. And at the bottom of each page, at the middle, there's a total for the page. 
So the left hand page is 80247 and that is to make it easier to check or look for mistakes in the addition when you're comparing the total of the debit balances with total credit balances. Get another page of debtor balances on the left, another one on the right, another page of debit balances on the left, and then on the right you get the first page of the creditor balances. And then another page of creditor balances on the left, another page on the right, and then halfway down the bookkeeper has started to do a check to see whether the total debits equals total credits. He started to discover mistakes and made adjustments and that's basically one of the reasons for this document. The other was that it was a report that was uh, used in order to identify where resources lay within all the branches by the head office and it also enabled the head office to check whether some of the balances shown for debtors for example were too old or too big and to just look at the way that the branch was being managed through the information contained in the report and then if any more information was needed they could ask for a copy of the account to be sent to head office from the branch and so on. Now if you look at that from a Whiggish perspective you do what Raymond de Ruber did when he looked at that same document. He took the document and in that chapter that you read he prepared a balance sheet. On the left hand side the assets are, are from top to bottom and then the liabilities are on the right hand side. Now he's not showing them as left versus right, He would. this is him just showing them in the sequence that they appeared. He didn't try to lay this out as um, one on the one side one on the other. But he constructed these from the data that was in that document. And he did that to help the modern reader understand it. And he was really trying to demonstrate that from that document you could create a balance sheet. And if you could create a balance sheet, well you're a long way towards recognizing it's double entry according to the definitions that he used. And he created a profit and loss account. And because it all worked in all balance, he could say that report demonstrates that the records kept by this business were in double entry. And he backs it up by saying he's looked at the entries in the, in the ledger and you can see the debits and the credits and the cross references. Now, if you take it at face value and you skim his article, and I think I've mentioned this before, you're going to think that that's what they did in those days, but they didn't. All they did was the report that you saw before I showed you what Deruber wrote. So if you read Deruber's and you think about it, it's given you a message that is modernised. It's Whiggish. It's looking for signs of the, of the present and the past. It's fitting the past into the present. It should be the other way around. History must always be revisited to check that that hasn't happened, apart from anything else. And also, well, of course, when you get new evidence, you should look at it, revisit what you've done before, see if anything's changed. But it must always be revisited. And that's the point that Arnold makes very, fairly often in his book. History is never fully known, and history must always be revisited. And if you take what was in the two articles you read, the Marchand's article was published in 1994. Stoner published in 2011. At that point, it would be very good to go back and look at what Le Marchand did to see if you get connection between the two findings relating to reporting, which would have given a much stronger view on when it became apparent that financial reporting was important and would have strengthened the argument that is put but with very little evidence in the literature that in the 19th century, particularly after the middle of the 19th century, the, the expansion in numbers of joint stock companies resulted in 
the beginnings of widespread adoption of double entry and the reports that could be produced from it. But they didn't. They didn't. They've never been connected together in literature, those two papers. But someone looking at the issue today would probably want to take them as a starting point and then go and do a full investigation of looking at how businesses, firms were using or, re or recording their bookkeeping in the 19th century and look beyond the joint stone company, see what others were doing, as Le Marchand did with his metallurgical companies and enterprises. <laughs>